You know, despite there being plenty of games about setting up an elaborate string of murders, such as Manhunt or Hitman, the thing that all of them have in common is the fact that you're always the one making the first move. They're kind of like slasher films in the regard that you're the one going to the victims to finish the job. However, what I find to be substantially more interesting is having the victim come to you and taking them out while you sit back and do nothing more than press a few buttons with a series of extremely elaborate traps. Just imagine setting up an insane array of Jigsaw-esque death traps for the sake of killing a single innocent person who accidentally entered your mansion. Now that's a concept I think hasn't been explored nearly enough in gaming, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been at all. Koei Tecmo's Deception series is just that, and honestly, it might just have become my favorite Tecmo series, period. Some time ago I decided to give myself a kick in the butt and finally decided to play all of these games, which I've had an interest in for years now. More specifically since I first played Trapped back in 2016. Now, I hadn't actually gone ahead and beaten it back then, but I really remember liking it. Having now gone through the entire series, I'm more than confident in saying that it deserved so much better. So I invite you to sit down and relax, because today, I'm gonna be talking about my favorite mass murder simulator. Tecmo's Deception Invitation to Darkness is easily the black sheep of the series, which is funny as it's the first one, yet it's fundamentally different from everything that came after. The story is rather simple. You play as the Prince of Zemechia, returning home after visiting your GF. The king decides it's time to pass the crown on to you, but out of nowhere your sword appears and kills him instantly. Your brother just so happens to show up and frames you for his murder, to which you are immediately sentenced to death. As you stand there before the gallows you think to yourself, man. I actually really fucking hate the poor and I wish I could kill all of them. A wish that is so powerful that Satan himself saves you and tells you to become the lord of his demonic mansion, where you will continue to systematically kill off anyone who dares enter, until you've consumed enough souls to revive him. Bad shit set up aside, this is where the gameplay kicks in. On a conceptual level, this is really cool. Each level is separated into several enemy waves. Each wave opens with a small cutscene explaining the reasoning for entering the mansion and coming after you, as well as allowing you to check their stats. Then you set up your traps anywhere you please in a building, even being able to create entire rooms if you so desire. Now in theory this all sounds really cool like you said, but man is it janky. As you've already seen from the footage, this game takes place entirely from the first person perspective, and thus it comes with the same controls as something like Echo Knight or LSD Dream Emulator. It often felt pretty clunky and adjusting the camera up or down could be really cumbersome sometimes. Though thankfully it was never bad enough to make the game any harder on its own. The real issue stems from how you activate the traps. Every time you place one at the start of the level, a yellow crystal appears in its place. To then use it, you have to stand directly in front of it, close enough for it to register and to make an enemy walk right into it, but not too close as to fall on yourself. It can be really irritating, though I thankfully got used to it rather quickly, but I would be lying if I said I didn't get really frustrated with it at times. The main reason for this is the fact that enemies have a certain evasion stat, and traps a hit rate. And because enemies usually have a pretty high evasion, that means that most traps that don't have a 100% success rate are going to be evaded again and again and again. It's so irritating when you constantly have to rely on the one same trap to bail you out every time. What doesn't help is that the traps are incapable of interacting with one another, due to the fact that you have to manually activate them all one by one. Furthermore, because they don't interact, there is no experimentation to be done outside of figuring out the magical trap that finally allows you to kill any specific enemy. They're gonna end up getting old real fast though, because animations never change. Now, there are two kinds of traps. The ones that capture an enemy, and the ones that kill them. Using lethal weapons kills the enemies instantly, rewarding you with instant cash. Capturing them on the other hand allows you to either steal their soul for magical power or just kill them for more money. Money being used for items and like and magic to buy more traps. Thanks to this, there's definitely a sort of resource management involved here, as you absolutely want to make sure never to run out of either. 
By far my biggest problem with the game is that some levels can go on for an excruciating amount of time. Now you can save between waves, but that doesn't help much when the waves themselves go on forever. Oftentimes they run out of traps mid-wave because enemies just kept dodging them like motherfuckers, and they end up having to run back to the crystal room to place more traps. Generally, the game's runtime overstays its welcome for a bit. It's nothing game-breaking by any means, but by the time I was done I couldn't help but feel like at least two hours of game time could have been cut, and I'd have been much happier for it. But I digress. The best part about this game has to be how unhinged it is though. Frequently I'd be forced to kill people, like a married couple just trying to get the money so they could afford a life-saving treatment for their child. It really manages to make you feel like a villain and honestly, I kinda love that. And it only gets stronger as the game goes on too, as you become more and more notorious. There's multiple endings and honestly the one I consider the best is the one considered a bad ending, but frankly I think it's the best one. I won't show it, obviously, as I don't like showing spoilers, but honestly, by it being such a simple story, it fits perfectly for what the game is trying to be. I would generally recommend playing this game, though I can easily see why some might find it archaic or just not worth sticking with. While the first game did technically start the series, Kagero is easily the game that laid down the foundation for everything that came after. There's a damn good reason why Millennia, the game's protagonist, is the one that's always featured in cameos or guest appearances in other games. Structurally, this game follows the same loop as the first, wherein there are several enemies per level, at most six, and you take them out in small waves, with there being a maximum of two enemies wandering about at any given time. The gameplay, on the other hand, has seen a massive overhaul. Gone are the boring single tile traps and amended evasion stats, replaced by traps that actually interact with each other that you can construct in real time. I cannot even begin to express how much of an improvement this is. The original game quickly devolved into figuring out what trap worked best against an enemy, spamming the floor full of it and hoping to god that the enemies don't dodge it as you fight the camera to activate them. Starting from this game though, none of that persists. Before each level, you can check the stats and affinities of every enemy and equip up the free traps per category. In game, you can set up the free traps at once, one on the ceiling, one on the wall, and one on the floor, each one activated by a corresponding face button. Each time you put a new trap down, there is a little cool cooldown before you can use it. This cooldown also shows up after using it. And while enemies can still dodge traps, it's not just some miscellaneous dodge, an evasion stat that works at seemingly random anymore, but instead each enemy has a specific class associated with them that has different skills, weaknesses and resistances. Ninjas for instance cannot be hit with floor traps. Well, unless they've already been hit by a different trap and currently in their recovery state. This combined with the cooldown system for the traps leads to what is easily my favorite part of the games. The trap combos. As mentioned before, all traps now interact with one another. Moving walls can launch away drop boulders, electric pillars can shock waters, springboards can now throw an enemy to the bottom of a flight of stairs, which are massively spiked boulders currently rolling down. You get the idea. This leads to there being essentially two ways to play the game. Option one is to set up a simple free hit combo per room and repeatedly luring the enemies into it. It's effective in what I used to do, but it's unsatisfying and ultimately handicaps you. No, the real way to play this game is to plan out your combos and really work on your execution. Setting everything up so that the second the trap's cooldown starts again, you swap it out and place it where your victim lands at the end of the starting combo, and then just keep the chain going for as long as possible. It's highly addictive in its own right, but it also rewards you with more art, which you can then in turn use to purchase more traps, with which to create even more elaborate combos. It's really fun to experiment and see what torture devices you can come up with, despite its good old PS1 jank. Unfortunately, actually playing Kagero can get pretty damn annoying in the end game, as it starts throwing wizards at you. Wizards can suck my fucking dick, as they can hit you from behind the fucking wall, and there is no way to dodge their fucking attacks. What also doesn't help is that the frame rate constantly dips and it can get really irritating later on. The plot is once again pretty simple, all things considered, but unlike the first one, where the endings are decided by your actions in the final mission, this game has proper branching pathways, depending on who you kill, who you allow to escape, and other actors. I really like this, as it organically blends the story with the gameplay without having only really dialogue options affect the endings. Bonus point for the protagonist, Millennia, reminding me a lot of Shinoa from Castlevania Order of Ecclesia 2 and sharing a name with a party member from my favorite game, Grandia 2. I wouldn't move on to Deception 3, but there is one thing I forgot to mention, arguably the best part about this game even. Every time you kill every enemy in a stage, no matter if they're a soldier, an old man, a child or even a random villager, the mission clear screen gives you a message that says PERFECT GENOCIDE, and it is genuinely the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life.
Deception 3 is the last game in the series to be released on PS1, and honestly I'd argue it holds up very well visually. The art style is really nice and the facial expressions are honestly pretty impressive for the time. On top of that, the frame rate is silky smooth, rarely ever dropping, which already makes it a step up from Kagero. It also has what is easily my favorite soundtrack in the series. This is the best game out of the PS1 trilogy, no questions asked. Everything from the UI to the visuals to even the trap crafting has seen upgrades that are immediately noticeable. By far the best change in my opinion though, has to be the addition of a dodge button. Alright, maybe it's not that good, uh, okay in truth it actually kinda barely even functions. Uh, furthermore, you have to double tap either R1 or L1 to activate it, which is incredibly awkward to do. Even the AI has severely improved though, while also having mostly fair hitboxes now. Honestly, there's really not that much I dislike about this game. But that certainly doesn't mean it's without flaws. The biggest complaint I have is the plot. It's not bad, but it's really weirdly paced and all four of the endings are so abrupt and frankly, shit, that it kinda just left me feeling confused. It's weird too, as up until the very end, the story is pretty damn easy to follow and then it just kinda gives up and dies. At the very least, the story isn't the main focus of these games and more like a side dish to fuel your murderous rampage. And man is this game great for that. If you're only going to play one game in the series to see if the mechanics would even interest you, then make it this one. It's absolutely worth your time. Alright, I've been putting it off for long enough. I need to address something very important that concerns the entire series. The naming of the games is one of the dumbest things I think I've ever seen. For the entire video thus now, I've been calling the games Deception, but that's not entirely correct. In the West, the games are called Tecmo's Deception Invitation to Darkness, Kagero Deception 2, Deception 3 Dark Delusion, Trapped, Deception 4 Blood Ties, and Deception 4 Nightmare Princess. Now, for the most part this makes sense, except that it leaves Trapped as a kind of outlier even though it's actually Deception 4, but then there's also Deception 4, which is the fifth one, and, and yeah, that just kind of leaves both of them in an awkward position. In Japan, on the other hand, nothing makes sense at all, because the games are called Kumeikan, Kagero Kumeikan Shinsho, Somato, Kagero 2 Dark Illusion, Kagero Dark Side Princess, and Kagero Nightmare Princess. I don't think I have to try and explain to you how dumb this is, you can definitely tell already. In any case, let's talk about Trapped. This game has lots of improvements from its predecessors, partly due to it being on newer hardware, but it also takes a few steps back. For one, the game is substantially shorter than any of the previous ones, but makes up for it by having far more side content. In particular, an entire alternate mode you can play alongside the story, which has some really cool challenges in it. Since you now have two sticks, you're also no longer tied to tank controls, which is really nice. Though it comes at the loss of the dodge button, which makes me a very sad man. Traps interact with each other way more than in 3, and everything is just so much smoother. The game is just all around nicer to play. Unfortunately, that's where the improvements end. For one, the trap crafting system from 3 is just totally gone. Instead, you buy new traps with the same currency, Warl, which enemies drop as you hit them with traps, and is separate from Arc, which is now more like a score. This wouldn't be so bad, but unfortunately, the same currency is also required to unlock more of your mansion. For whatever reason, and and this is completely asinine, the devs decided to lock certain rooms in your mansion behind items that you have to buy with the same currency as traps. So it becomes a matter of whether you want to waste a large chunk of cash on a new room, which you don't even know the gimmick of yet, or if you'd rather buy new traps. What doesn't help is that rooms are sometimes stupidly expensive, and considering the fact that you don't even spend the entire game in the mansion but constantly travel throughout several locations, it's not even worth it to bother with them if you ask me. Unless you really want to move around more and are okay with sacrificing getting new traps for several missions. The camera is also just plain dog shit sometimes because of how close it is to Allura, a problem I've never had in any prior game. I can deal with a shitty camera, don't get me wrong. What I can't deal with is not being able to see the fucking enemies! They try to remedy this by giving you a lock-on button that focuses the camera on a specific enemy, but there is no way to manually adjust the lock, so sometimes it just won't work like you'd want it to. Even jittering all over the place, constantly swapping between targets if you're really unlucky. The story is also very underwhelming, they didn't even try to go for something stupidly ambitious like 2 or 3, instead just copy-pasting the plot from the first game, and yet they still managed to fill it with lore inconsistencies and weird plot holes. But, as I said earlier, you shouldn't really play these games for the story anyway, but for the perfect genocide. I'd still wholeheartedly recommend this game to anyone with an affinity for Rube Goldberg machines though, especially if you can't stomach the PS1 jank of Deception 2 and 3. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say this is the second best game in the series, though my favorite is still Deception 3. God damn, this game pissed me off. Fundamentally, it's fine. A very decent game. Though it does have some changes to the gameplay that I really didn't like. 
For one, instead of mapping one trap per type to a corresponding button, you can now place up to any seven traps of the ones you've equipped for the current mission. Unlike the older games, you can now equip them all in a sequence and then press the same button again and again, though you can manually toggle the currently active one with the shoulder ones. Am I fond of this change? No, but it's not a game breaker. What is a game breaker is the fucking AI and enemy types. Holy shit, this game is so frustrating. All of the new enemy types fucking suck. Ninjas have gotten substantially worse, and those flame slash freeze thrower guys can suck my fucking dick. You die so quickly that using the dodge and self-healing ability equips is essentially mandatory. It's not like the others are particularly useful, mind you, but it still fucking sucks that I have to do this. This wouldn't be so bad if the levels were like as short as the older games, but no, they usually have 16 to 18 enemies coming for your ass in a sequence of three waves each. You do not get a break between waves either. You do not get to save. You either do them all or you start over. It's such a shit way of doing things and it baffles me that they thought this would be a good idea. While the locations and music are good, hell, I'd argue this game has the best soundtrack in the series next to free, the story is terrible. This is by far the least interesting story in the series thus far, with no likable or hateable characters, no interesting reveals and plot twists that feel as forced as a Persona game. What doesn't help is that the writing is fucking atrocious, being nothing but a long chain of anime tropes and stereotypes. This is something I just do not get. You play the devil's fucking daughter with no remorse for human life, more so focused on making sure their deaths are as painful as feasibly possible. So then why is it that almost every single person you kill is on some level an asshole? Now there are some innocent civilians you can't kill, but you can also just choose to let them escape. Every other game forces you to kill at least a handful of innocent bystanders, in some cases against your will. One of the earliest missions in the first game has you killing a man and his wife trying to get money to save their child's life. Kagura opens with you murdering an entire family for no real reason, and Trap's first victim is a knight who wants to peacefully talk to you because he's in love with the protagonist. Even Reina, the protagonist of Deception 3, who's the only one to not be a bloodthirsty psychopath, is forced to cause several civilian casualties. It feels so out of place when the one character who for all intents and purposes should be the most fucked up of them all is merely a walking anime trope with a horrible design and dialogue that reads like a teenager trying to sound cool wrote it. In fact, the entire game is anime as fuck. Don't even get me started, man. The best example of this is the character Zeno Shin. You fight him a total of three times throughout the game and he's the physical embodiment of all I hate in anime characters. He's loud, obnoxious, and constantly talks about his dumbass justice bullshit. I'm frankly not sure if they intended to make the most annoying character ever written, but man did they get close to making me want to throw down an entire fucking bottle every time he was on screen. Even the art leaves a lot to be desired, and the character designs are just plain dog shit. I'm not even gonna pretend like the designs in prior games were all that great either, especially the ones from Trap looked awful, but the ones in this game may as well be fucking naked. Another thing I really didn't like was how goofy the game tried to be at times. Traps are now divided into three categories, being sadistic, elaborate, and humiliating. Humiliating traps are mostly shit you'd see in a Looney Tunes skit or something. Like a rake on the floor or a giant pumpkin falling from the sky. It's nice that the game knows how silly it is, sure, but Part of the charm of the older games for me was how seriously they took themselves and really tried to make you feel bad for killing a lot of people, at least to some extent. Now it's as if they want you to laugh at them, which, fair enough, I did, but primarily because of how stupidly they ran into my traps. I will give the game praise where it's due though, because it genuinely terrified me more than any horror game ever could with just one single character. Victor fucking Logos. This motherfucker is terrifying, he's fast as fuck has projectiles that can hit you halfway across the room, can stun you, is immune to just about every trap, and can break all traps in his vicinity if he feels like it. I was genuinely scared shitless of this dude, primarily because it meant having to restart the entire level if I died. That is until I discovered an infinite trap loop. So, welcome to the KHC Death Machine Showcase! At the entrance of this room, I have laid down a spiked wall which pulls the enemy towards itself. From there, I use Satan's fist to launch them to the other side of the room, where a smash wall pushes them onto a launch pad, which leads them right into a hammer, which leads them into a swinging axe that launches them to a second launch pad, which brings them back to the first tile of the combo, where by now the spiked wall has already recharged, meaning I can loop this infinitely. This was very satisfying to do. This is easily my least favorite of the games, not counting the first one. However, I do think there is a perfectly valid reason for why the game ended up the way it did. You see, these games have always been made by the same exact team as the Project Zero series. That's Fatal Frame for those of you living in America. And they've been around since before Project Nero was even a thing. 
Now, Blood Ties came out in 2014, the same year as Project Zero Five, Maiden of Black Water. This means that both games were developed at the same time by the same exact team for two completely different systems. Project Zero Five being a Wii U game and Deception 4 a PS3 game. So, to me this explains why both of these games feel so underwhelmingly unfinished, I guess you could say, and frankly soulless. Well, Project Zero Five more so than Deception 4 because that game is inexcusable fucking dog shit and a big fat stain on otherwise pretty good horror series. It's hard to say which of these two games got more care, as coming up with new ideas and stories for two entirely separate series at the same time can't possibly have been an easy job. But honestly, I think Deception 4 got more love out of the two, primarily because it ended up getting an expansion slash sequel just a year later. Is Nightmare Princess better than Blood Ties? Yes. Is it better than Free or Trapped though? Not really. Upfront, if you get Nightmare Princess on any platform, be it PS3, PS4 or PS Vita, you also get the entirety of Blood Ties for free. Which is a damn good deal, I'd say. The first thing that immediately stood out to me was the mission structure for this game is completely different than anything that came before. Instead of a linear story progression, you have a set of individual quests that you can unlock and play in any order you want. I generally really liked this change, as it meant that if I ever got fed up with a level, I could just take a break and do another one and come back whenever I have more traps. You can also unlock all previous protagonists in the series, barring the Prince of Zemechia, as playable characters. Which was really neat, as they all play differently enough from one another to make them worth getting. Melania ended up being my favorite, as she brings back the free button gameplay type of the older games. Though I ended up mostly using Reyna because she has an auto dodge. As a result of the short burst mission structure, levels are now locked to at most 4 enemies per stage and give you a strict time limit, which at most gives you 5 minutes. The pace of the game is substantially faster because of this, and that is something I really liked. A lot of the quests were also really fun and made me experiment with combinations and traps I would otherwise never have thought to use. And that's about where the good ends. If you want to progress through the story, then your chances are you're gonna do either Route A or Route B. While B does lead back to A, both are a massive pain in the ass to go through, forcing you to do a whole string of unrelated quests just so you can unlock a random ability which is mandatory for the mission you were actually going to do. A lot of the quest conditions are also legitimately painful and had me stuck for hours, as they either demand some insane execution or just had the most annoying AI known to man. And when that wasn't the issue, then it most certainly was the bonus requirements for getting the item you wanted instead, especially the ones for unlocking the other characters can be insanely painful. Oh yeah, that's how you unlock traps in this game. Instead of just buying them from a miscellaneous shop, you just get them as a reward for fulfilling certain tasks within each level. I really like this, because it also means that I have to properly work towards getting the traps I want to use, instead of just breezing through the entire game with a single combo. Not that the mission structure would allow that anyway. Rarely have I ever played a game that so frequently made me go from this is great to I want to murder the fucking developers on a dime and back. The story was also pretty messy. The mandatory big reveal that changes everything these games tend to have for whatever reason is quite possibly the strangest one yet and doesn't even make sense to me in universe. But it's still a substantially more interesting plot than Blood Ties. Overall, a good game, but man can it be frustrating. I would definitely recommend playing it at your own leisure, and playing missions as they come to expand your arsenal, and then to return to the more dickish missions once you've comfortable enough, rather than trying to blitz through the story. I'd definitely consider it worth playing just as much as 2, 3, and Trapped, but there's a catch. You see, this is a Koei Tecmo game, which means that this 6 year old fucking game still costs 50 bucks on digital stores, not counting the DLC. And it never goes on sale either. Uh, never change Koei. Actually no, please do. Grown changes a company, what What the fuck? This game is six fucking years old, this fucking shit is stupid. And thus concludes Deception. Well, I guess Kagero, if that's what you want to call it. Personally, I really enjoyed my time with the series, and I honestly kind of like every game in the series, even Blood Ties. I would highly recommend you check them out. There really is nothing else quite like it, and whilst it can be a bit awkward to get into, I promise you that it's fucking fantastic once you do. Cheers, and do me a favor here, have a fantastic day, evening, or night.